you know, one of the biggest jokes I see is people will be promoting their their system or their model or their quant course or whatever it is. And they'll say, you know, it you know takes the stress out of trading. You know, you've got the signals. You, you, you don't have to worry about it. It makes this like it makes it so easy on you. And guess what? Like if you're losing, it still feels like you're losing. And if you're <laughs> winning, it still feels like you're like you get a bunch of losing trades in a row. It feels like you're never going to have another winner again. Right. Markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast. This is episode 269 on Chat with Traders. It's Tessa, your co host. When I hear the words quant trading, it's like I have this instant automatic resistance to it. I think because it just sounds intimidating, complex, abstract, and so much crazy work. I would think to myself, Trading the regular way is challenging enough. Imagine what it would take to become a quant trader. Well, if it were easy, everyone would become one, right? Well, guess what? This episode is especially dedicated to the quant and quant curious traders. And you may want to take some notes because Ian has done a great job extracting valuable insights from our guests today. Our guest is Rob Hanna. Rob is regarded as one of the prominent industry swings overnight and quantitative researchers. He has been known for his approach of evaluating market conditions and price action using uncorrelated systems. If I did my numbers right, Rob has been using quantitative analysis in his trading for at least 15 plus years of the 22 plus years of his trading career. We have included more information about Rob and his work in the episode show notes on the Chat with Traders website. After being laid off in 2001, Rob became a successful discretionary full-time trader until the shock of his first major losing year in 2004. This was the event that propelled Rob to find quantifiable statistical edges that would help smooth out his equity curves. Knowing the dangers of curve fitting in trying to find that perfect system, Rob zeroed in on simpler approaches that would combine seasonality, overbought, oversold, and Federal Reserve days. The result is a system that helps minimize anxiety and drawdowns while keeping him invested for the bulk of bullish moves. Ladies and gentlemen, we're so pleased to present Mr. Rob Hanna from Massachusetts. Well, Rob, welcome to Chat with Traders. Thank you so much. I've been looking forward to doing this. I've listened to your podcast for a long time, actually, and uh, Tessa... Uh, reached out to me. I was I was like, oh wow, this would be really neat to do. So I'm excited to be able to talk to you with you. Yeah, great, great to have you on. Why don't you uh, share with us a little bit about your background? I went to uh, I went to Boston College. I grew up in New Jersey, and then I went to uh, to to BC, and I studied economics uh, through the business school. There was actually economics was offered uh, both in the uh, arts and science school and the business school. And I, uh, I initially got admitted to arts and science, and then I decided to transfer to business primarily to avoid the, the language requirement. I didn't have to take a foreign language if I transferred to business. So that was my lazy way of switching <laughs> <laughs> to, to, the, to the business uh, school. I've always been interested in the market, you know, even when I was, you know, in, in, in high school. Um, I never traded uh, when I was that young, but... You know, I remember watching uh, movies and TV and, and, you know, seeing the market on and, and hearing about, you know, I had some, I live in New Jersey, so I had several family friends. Uh, we were about mm, 45 minutes to an hour from New York City. So they worked on Wall Street. Uh, they all did well for themselves and uh, it seemed like uh, an exciting profession. So it was something I, I, I thought about. And then when I was in college, I had an internship on Wall Street at uh, at Garvin and Guy Butler, where they traded Fed funds. It was like an open outcry pit, basically. And there was a giant marker board on the side, and they had a little elevated ramp that you would stand on, or I would stand on. And the brokers would all yell out their bids and offers, and I would have to update the marker board, erasing them and putting writing the new bids down. Uh, and that was my my summer internship. And it's it, a little funny story about that is my first day there. I mean, I was pretty good in math. Uh, I was I was almost strong in math. So right, I, I came in. The first question those the brokers had for me was, "Well, how are you with math?" And I said, 
fine. They're like, how are you with your fractions? I'm like, uh, yeah, I know my fractions. And they're like, yeah, sure you do. Go sit in the corner. You, you don't know your fractions uh, when you got 40 brokers all screaming at you and you got to know where to put what fraction between what fraction. So go sit in the corner and learn your fractions uh, by 60 fourths. And I spent the first day sitting in the corner, <laughs> learning my fractions, reviewing them, making sure I knew that, you know, five thirty seconds versus uh, seven sixty uh, fourths and, and all that, which was uh, which was higher when I was getting screamed at. Wow. So uh, that was back in the, the day. When was that? Uh, 90s? That was 1991. So they so, traded in fractions back then uh, before before they yeah. moved to. Yeah. Wow. Well. <laughs> and they were all on phones. I mean, nothing was computerized. It was a bunch of brokers sitting at a desk talking on phones to the banks. Most of the trading happened and it still does like early morning or late afternoon. There wasn't, uh, you know, at, at lunchtime, most of the people were sitting around and uh, it was a lot of quiet and every once in every few minutes someone would say to change a bit or whatever but that was about it what do they say about trading and it still holds true it's like uh how, how would it hours of boredom boredom followed by uh, uh panic right mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, uh, and that's especially for day traders it's not so much like that for me anymore i don't i don't do uh, uh much in the way of day trading uh even so it's you know there's you got nothing going on and nothing going on and nothing going on and then all of a sudden Tons hits, right? So life in general is like that, right? They say things happen in threes and, you know, everything's going good. And then all of a sudden everything's going bad. And that's uh, uh, trading is kind of a microcosm of life in that way, I think. Yeah. So um, how about after your internship, uh, after you graduated from school, where did you go yeah. to? So I wanted to stay in Boston and um, uh, we that was in 92. Uh, I didn't want to go back to... Uh, New York, New Jersey. So I did odd jobs for a while. And then we, I eventually went to Thompson Financial Software, part of Thompson Financial, which later became uh, Refinitiv, which later now is part of London Stock Exchange. But I was there for seven or eight years. Uh, and what I did there is I sold their uh, investment software. So it was, mo it was portfolio accounting software that we would sell to large money management firms and uh, they would do all their back office stuff on it. And there was a, a trading front end for some places used it, but they'd run their performance reports, they'd do compliance and they'd do accounting on our software. I had to get into these institutions and learn about their business and figure out how our software would, would fit in with them. And at that time I became real interested in trading and I started doing it myself. So I started with some simple, uh, with a kind of a combination, you know, I, I read the William O'Neill stuff and I got into the, you know, I, I would do IBD and, and look for breakouts and, and uh, trade in that manner. And at the same time, I was also learning uh, day and swing trading techniques. Um, this was mid to late nineties. Larry Connor's site was called Trade Hard at the time. It later became Trading Markets. And that was my first kind of intro to some of the players there. I, I liked uh, Larry and his work and Dave Landry and his work and, uh, and Jeff Cooper. And so I would, I would look for setups that I found that I learned from them. And then I would trade those setups each day and hold them, you know, either for the day or for, uh, for a few days. So you were reading the Investor's Business Daily publication, is that right? Yeah, yeah. And then and you were you using the the can slim method? Exactly. Uh huh. Right. So well, what is that? Uh, to tell us for the listeners. Uh, I can't remember right now what the acronym stands for, but it's basically uh, the method that William O'Neill made famous, and he uh, tracked in, in Investor's Business Daily, and it looks to trade high quality stocks, high growth stocks that are breaking out to new highs. And he looks at certain patterns, uh, like he uses a cup and handle technical pattern or, you know, a high tight flag or flat breakouts or you know, things like that, where, or a uh, flat base, excuse me, um, where you, you wait for a stock to hit a new high and break out of a basing formation. And then you hope that it's in an uptrend. There was an uptrend is emerging. And so you look to ride that trend for a period of uh, days or weeks or months. And so I traded that and I, I traded that in conjunction with a lot of shorter term methods. So 
like Jeff Cooper in his book had these little sell-ups. He would call them like funky little names like Gilligan's Island or uh, Turtle Soup or, you know, um, silly names like the lizards. And uh, I'd look for those kinds of setups as well. And one of the things I found is that some of the best swing trades actually occurred in the strongest trending stocks. So a lot of times I was kind of trading around my can slim positions and it seemed great for a while. Uh, of course, you did anything in the late 90s stock market. As long as you're going long, you were pretty much a genius. <laughs> um, so <laughs> my method worked very well for a while, uh, as did most everybody's at that time. Um, so was there any distinction between the uh, investor business daily approach compared to the shorter term trading approach? And was there one that was, did you find in retrospect that was more effective than the other uh, during that time period? Well, the, the investor's business daily was more of a, a slower approach, right? So, uh, and it also, it had low probability win rate. Now it didn't need a high win rate. So I would, uh, I could do very well being right on, you know, let's call it 15%. I think I measured it out to somewhere between 12 and 15% of my trades it actually went on to be sizable winners, but the rest were mostly scratches, right? So, uh, I'd buy the breakout. It wouldn't work. It would kind of come back to where it started or a little below there where my stop point was. And I'd move my stop up pretty quick with them a lot of times. And, and so I'd scratch the trade. And I'd end up scratching, scratching, scratching. And then once in a while, you'd hit a winner. And it only took a few winners a year, um, you know, if you're making a 50 or 100 percent in a, in a position to, to really matter. The day and swing trading methods I utilized had much higher win rates. But of course, you know, we were making a few points in a stock rather than 50 uh, percent or something like that. You're only holding on to it for a few hours rather than a few months. So uh, you were doing this uh, while you were working a full-time job? Yes. I see. Yes. Did, did you uh, later transition to full-time trading? Yes. So uh, yeah, around the end of 2000, I left Thompson Investment Software. And I went to BMC Software. And I sold their software for a little while. I wasn't very happy there. I knew I wanted to be a trader. And so I had a friend who worked with hedge funds, setting them up. And he basically gave me the documentation I would need if I wanted to set up my own fund. Uh, what I did is I set up uh, a fund and I established it in August of 2001. And it was just, it was my money and uh, a little bit of my parents' money. It, it wasn't a lot of money, but it just had, it was set up as an LLC uh, or set up as an LP, which was managed by an LLC. Uh, so it had a hedge fund structure, uh, and it was just so that I could really be able to show a performance record um, and then look to grow it out you know, later on. Uh, and I was still working uh, at BMC at that time. Then 9-11 happened, and uh, there was big layoffs at BMC like a month later, and I was part of those layoffs. And I said, you know what? This might be my opportunity to become a full-time trader. And so that's kind of where I started. It was uh, getting laid off that got me my full-time trader position. Right. So uh, did you continue with your strategies that you had uh, cultivated um, sometime, some years earlier with the same type of strategies and just worked with that? Yes. So that I did that for the next few years. And 2001, 2002 were all you know bear market years. They were tough. And, uh, and then 2003 was a, a bull market year. But I did well in all of them. Uh, you know, I was, I was good at uh, staying out of the market uh, during much of the bear market and taking shots with some shorts and, and, and making money there. My swing trading methodologies were doing pretty good. So I was scratching out decent gains, nothing huge, but you know, I was, uh, I was making money when everybody else was losing it. So, so that was pretty good. And then in 2004, that was my first real tough year. Like I said, I was trading a lot of can slim type stuff. And what happened in that year it was a very rotational market. So, you know, energy stocks would would break out, and then uh, a few days later they'd collapse back into their base, and you'd see uh, tech stocks break out, and then they'd fall back into their base, and then, uh, you know, consumer discretionary would break out, and and so I was taking a bunch of stuff and getting churned and 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 completely chopped up, and that was my first down year. I wasn't 
down a whole lot, but it was frustrating because now I'm a full-time trader, right? So if you don't make money for a year, that's tough. Mm -hmm. And so that led me to kind of rethink a lot of what I had learned and, and relook at methods and look at the weaknesses in my approach. And I was good at riding the trend when I was able to capture it. What I was not good at was picking tops and bottoms, right? So uh, I was always over-invested at the top, right? Because we were riding the uptrend. And I was only always under-invested at the bottom because I, or I was partially short and the bottoms were even more severe. So I, I began doing the first of my quantitative research and I studied uh, bottoms and how they formed. And I did it with, uh, you know, I looked at long, long, as long a charts as I could find for the S and P 500, for the Dow, for uh, the NASDAQ, and then any of the, uh, uh, you know, sectors. So I, I looked at uh, sectors going back a long time as well. And I devised, I, I started researching and, and that kind of led me to starting to develop a quantitative method. Right. So from that research, I developed some models, some that I still make trades in today, and they do a good job of picking bottoms. Anyone that's followed my work has probably seen me talk about the my capitulative breadth index and what I call my catapult system. That was something that came out of this initial research in, in well, maybe it was a couple of years after that. It was around 2005 or so that I was 2006 that I was really starting to to get into, all right, how do we how do we take advantage of these big reversals off bottoms? Mm -hmm. My thought was if I had a method to take advantage of that reversal, I already had a method to, to do the trend and, and so forth. So that's um, I was trying to fill the holes at that point in time. I see. So up until that point, you were a discretionary trader. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, and so you had quite a few years of success under your belt. Were there any did you feel that um, the 2004 experience was kind of unfixable or did you get into quantitative research as a way to supplement your discretionary trading? Initially, I did it as a way to supplement it. Yeah, it mm -hmm. wasn't that uh, I thought my entire approach was broken, but I wanted to be able to you know, fill in the gaps in my trading. And so, mm -hmm. so that's what I was initially looking to do. So how were the first few years of being a quant trader? The methods I used to trade individual stocks and, and like that catapult system did very well from the start. But then I had other methods that that didn't do nearly as well. So it was a little bit of trial and error back then. And I was still learning how to design a system without over-optimizing, right? So I you don't want to say, hey, you know, this is this is an approach that would have worked on this chart in the past. And now how do I get rid of the the bad trades? Like that's the worst way to to try and build a system. And that was kind of my thought initial early on was, well, how do I get rid of these bad trades? Really, you want the bad trades to be in there so you can see what the potential downside is of using a, a system. So research, once I figured out research was more for learning about market tendencies than it is the uh, trying to find the holy grail, that helped me an awful lot. Mm -hmm. Were you a programmer prior to becoming a quant? No. So I, see. I took Fortran in high school. <laughs> I don't know if that's still a language, but <laughs> um, uh, I learned how to program in TradeStation. I basically you know, read what was the TradeStation easy language book at the time and started messing around in trade station and it kind of came back to me a little bit at that point like how to program so how to think through writing a program and i later learned that easy language was based on fortran so it was easy for me to kind of start to learn how to do it and so that was that was something that you know I, i'm i'm still a hack at programming but now i'm a hack in numerous languages i guess you'd say I've read in some of your publications, you say that uh, quant analysis is the next generation of technical analysis. Explain for that a little bit. Well, uh, so technical analysis is basically looking at uh, chart patterns, right? So whether you're looking at uh, support and resistance or whether you're looking at uh, what volume might mean on certain bars or what, you know, what it means when you're oversold or overbought, you need to be able to read a chart. Uh, or at least describe a chart. So if you look at a chart, you need to you need to understand the chart, right? So 
hey, we opened at the low, we closed at the high today, uh, and we did it on uh, big volume, and uh, we did it, and we closed at the you know, the highest price of the last two weeks, but we're still in a long-term downtrend. Whatever, you need to be able to describe what's happening. Um, and a quant approach basically takes, allows you to test all those patterns that candlesticks and, and other technical analysis type of uh, approaches look at. So if, uh, well, just the, the, the simple things that I look at. So or a few days ago, I was looking at, uh, you know, what happens if we have uh, three down days and we close at a 10 day low and we're above the 200 day moving average. That's all something that you look at a chart and you see on a chart. And then I use a computer to describe that and say, all right, what's happened over the next one, two, three, four, five days, whatever, um, every time we've had that setup in the past. So it's a matter of looking at the chart, describing the setup to yourself, and then seeing if it means anything moving forward. And mm-hmm. sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. I see. So before uh, one gets into a quantitative analysis, uh, sounds like you highly recommend getting very well versed in technical analysis uh, first, because that is the bedrock uh, of which quant analysis is based on. Yeah. And you don't have to know uh, necessarily, you know, what each pattern supposedly means, because you're going to go out and try and figure that out yourself. Right. But you do have to be able to identify moves in the market. You know, it, it's nice to be able to test, you know, all the candlesticks, uh, for instance, typically pretty easy to test if you put you know, reasonable parameters around them. Uh, a lot of things that are in technical analysis are a little vague. And so I try and make things less vague. I, I did it. So, for instance, the whole idea behind Investors Business Daily and the can slim methodology is you're you're buying strong stocks um, that are breaking out and you're looking to to get to to capture an uptrend. And most of what he teaches, I think, is really good. But the one piece where he doesn't, I believe, teach it well is the M, which stands for market, right? So one of the things that he looks for is after there's been a decline in the market, uh, he looks for a follow through day, right? So that's the market reverses. And then a few days later, there's a uh, uh, at least a 1% up day on very strong volume. And that's supposed to give the all clear to start buying breakouts again, uh, according to the book and and the newspaper. So uh, I spent a long time studying follow through days and quantifying them. And there's, it sounds pretty straightforward, but it's, it's not like what, how much of a decline do you need before you're looking for a follow through day? How, uh, how strong does the follow through day have to be? Can it be in any market? Um, what is your definition of success on a follow through day? Like, does the market need to reach a new high? Does it need to go up at least as much as it's already gone up? Um, how long from the low until the supposed follow through day is, is valid? You know, uh, I think they said somewhere between four and 10 days is best. So I tested that. So these are all little nuances that years ago, and you can still find it on the blog. Back in like 2008, 2009, 2010, I was I was testing the concepts of follow through days. Overall, I found them to not be terribly helpful in in market analysis. But all the other ideas that, or many of the other ideas, I did I did find um, useful for you know that William O'Neill puts out there. So you certainly can make money buying breakouts and riding trends. So were you, uh, was your objective at the time to create a system that would give you the signals of, for example, go long this, go short that, so that you wouldn't have to spend so many hours on the screen every day looking at every tick like is so common with, uh, with many day traders? Yeah, um, but I also wanted to have a way to set my market bias. So that was really what I was studying at night. So when I would go... You know, I might be long or short a position. And if there was a real strong move against me, let's say, that felt horrible going into the night, right? Um, mm-hmm. So what I would do is I would take a look at what the market's done, where it's at, and is there a reason for me to still be in this position? You know, did the big move against me signal a, a failed setup? Uh, should I be getting out right now? Or uh, is the upside edge apparently still there? Or maybe it's even stronger at this point. 
So that that's the kind of thing that I was trying to understand. And that's that's one of the things I found over the years that quantitative analysis for me has made it easier from a psychological standpoint to trade. Because when I would be in a position, no matter how I felt about it, I'd do my research that night and then I could say, all right, you know, today was a bad day, but it looks like uh, we're likely to turn in the next few days. So I got to hold on to this position still. Or the opposite where, you know, today was a great day and uh, it's unlikely to continue much further than this time to get out. So was the quantitative analysis that you were doing acting as like your advisor at the end of the day to help say, hey, look at this data, you know, the probabilities that it's going to continue the up move or you should get out, uh, what have you. Uh, and you were making the trades manually. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I'd, I'd be, uh, you know, back then I'd have manual positions. I mean, I still t- take trades manually, but not discretionary. Right. Most of my trading is based off of, of, of systems these days or, or models that I've built. So it would it would have let me establish my market bias, not just for those positions, but what's important is for, you know, whatever new positions I'm looking to consider. Right. So uh, and this is something I've done for 15 years or so and uh, still do to this day where, you know, I do my market analysis every night and I want to have a bias going into the next day. Uh, and whether that's it basically, like, I keep it simple. Am I short term bearish, bullish or neutral? And uh, if I'm short term bullish, I'm only looking for long positions. If I'm short term bearish, I'm only looking for short positions. And if I'm neutral, I'll, I'll look for either, but they, they need to, they need to have, you know, a real high probability behind them. Did the quant information that you would get at the end of each day then act as kind of like you were almost like a psychological uh, guide to help you determine whether you're going to get in or out of that position so that you what did you have to deal less with the regular psychological aspects of trading, uh, trading mentality because you had this quantitative advisor, so to speak? Exactly. Uh, did you? Re- oh, I see. So you did. Did you find that, um, did that help you get around the the psychological challenges of regular trading? Yeah, it helped me greatly. I mean, you, you, you kind of start off, a lot of people do with maybe what you call a gambler's mentality, right? And and you, you ride the, the ups and downs uh, like you're at a craps table, right? right? Really, you, you don't want to be a gambler. You want to be the casino. So by constantly studying the odds, I've been able to turn my trading from being, hey, I was a, a, I was a pretty good gambler, but now, you know, I've always got the odds in my favor, not always massively in my favor, but, you know, I know what they are and, and, um, and everything's measured before I go into a trade. Do, are there any uh, unique type of psychological or mindset issues that are, are unique to quants uh, that you still have to deal with? Yes. I mean, it doesn't, you know, one of the biggest jokes I see is people will be promoting their their system or their model or their quant course or whatever it is, and they'll say, you know, it, it takes the uh, you know it takes the stress out of trading. You know, you've got the signals, you you, you don't have to worry about it. It, it makes this like it makes it so easy on you. And guess what? Like if you're losing, it still feels like you're losing, and if you're <laughs> winning, it still feels like you're like you get a bunch of losing trades in a row. It feels like you're never going to have another winner again, right? And uh, streaks still feel as bad uh, when they're going against you, and they still feel as good when they're going your way. But you've got, a, I think, a little more assurance of yourself. Like you've got a little bit more of a reality check that you know. All right, it's not going to always be this bad. It's not going to always be this good, and you can see that in the data. I see. Were you ever tempted to uh, convert your quantitative approach to also an algo approach, so that you wouldn't wouldn't have to deal with any of that? Just let the algo trade for you. Well, yeah. I mean, some of the models that I trade are uh, basically what you'd call algo models, right? So, in fact, most everything is these days. So i I don't necessarily let it drive itself from the standpoint of like none of them are day trading models. So what I do is I'll run the model at night and I'll see what's triggering. And then I double check before uh, 
uh, a trade is placed because I want to make sure that you know it's not kicking off something odd. So, for instance, if if I get a signal to go long some S and P 500 stock, and I don't look at and I just let the computer go and do it, and I don't look at the chart, I may not realize that hey, that stock just got you know that company just got bought out. It's it's really mm-hmm. it's just going sideways for the next month or so until the until the merger is complete. Right. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So I always want to uh, make sure the signal's correct. And, you know, even with um, and sometimes the software kicks out a bad signal, you get a bad uh, you get a bad tick or something like that. So I don't just let trades flow through. I, I always check and then enter my orders manually. I see. Uh, Do you think that some people get into quant trading or even algo trading, say for the wrong reasons, like say not wanting to deal with the trading mindset and the psychology and the cultivated intuitions and screen time that's often necessary and surrender it to some uh, kind of an automated system or a system that's kind of outside of themselves. Do you, do you ever see any issues with that? Yeah. If you're not, well, you can't push it off to the computer or even to someone else and never worry about it again right if it is not in your personality and it depends on how big of you know a portion of your portfolio you're pushing off it's easy to say hey take uh uh let's take 10 percent of my portfolio and run with it uh this certain way but if you're a beginning trader and uh you know you can't divide your portfolio into 10 parts and uh, you just need a model to to start to run with um, then you really should be involved in, in learning about it if you have an interest in it. Regardless of what the model is or whether you're trading it or someone else is trading it, you're still going to live the ups and downs. You're still going to get excited when it does well, and you're still going to get disappointed when it doesn't, right? So uh, if you go into algo trading thinking, hey, I'm just going to you know, push the buttons or you know, flip the switch and it's going to make a bunch of money for me, you're going to get disappointed. And if you don't know what's behind the system, if you're not certain what the system is based on, if it's not true edges that that it's looking to take advantage of, um, then that'll bring in even more doubts. Um, so even if you have a system that's great, it's going to go through losing periods and you're going to get scared out of it potentially if you're not confident it's great. So what are the differences and similarities between quantitative and algorithmic trading? Are they essentially the same except for the quantitative is it's still a manual approach that you eventually hit, you know, hit the buy and sell and the algorithmic trading is taking that same data and automatically trading for you. I've never made a distinction myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, but yeah, I mean, the way we've been talking about it, 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 for me, a quantitative approach is just understanding the odds, right? However you want to define that. But I guess uh, an algorithmic would be com- completely computerized, right? And I think um, uh, without that kind of, uh, without any intervention for pressing the button, right? So a mechanical system that, uh, that, that can run itself rather than you having to, to run it. I've had algo systems in the past that I set up, for instance, in TradeStation that, you know, you turn on in the morning and turn off and, uh, when the market closed. And it's, to me, they're no less emotional and they're no less worrisome, right? If, if you get an internet outage or uh, <laughs> the computer crashes or, you know, whatever happens, uh, you still got to, there's still a million things to worry about with algo as opposed to doing it manually. I'd like to dive into a little bit of the perceived complexity and difficulty of being a quant. Have you estimated how much time you needed to spend over the years, you know, programming, researching, backtesting, and how often potential strategies are thrown out because they're overused by others in the past? Let me break that down. Are you asking how much time I spend? Yeah, over the years, um, okay. the time that you invested in doing all this research uh, to come up with uh, various systems, and did you? How long were you able to use these systems, and you know that whole process? So I have I don't I haven't thrown out a whole lot of systems over the years that I've. Uh, I mean, that's not true. I've, I've thrown out a, a good number, but. I rarely tweak system. I go, I take a real broad look at the edges I'm trying to identify. I look at general ways to take advantage of those edges. I make sure that the edge is robust and um, 
I have, you know, I don't want, I don't want a system to work with certain parameters and, and not others. So um, as long as the edge persists, I've been able to continue to trade models for, for years. Most of the models I have now are, are several years old. Uh, you know, I mentioned like the catapult system that I designed in, I don't know, it was 2005 or so. I still trade it, as, you know, as I wrote it many years ago. You know, the way I trade, um, I've had a, a few spy systems over the years, but the ones I'm trading now I've had for four or five years at least. You know, there's a, like, uh, I did a market timing course at Quantifiable Edges in 2014. And it's a simple course, like you go through it in like an hour. And it's more intermediate term, but it's it takes a look at four different indicators and uh, two of them are price-based and, and two are seasonality-based. And it looks at, oh, you know, is there an edge? Do these provide an edge? And how could we combine them? And I did that in 2014. And then I updated the course this summer. And I, I showed how the, the models that I did then have continued to perform over the last nine years. And as far as I was concerned, nothing needed changing. Um, I did add one more indicator that's based on Fed liquidity. And, and so I created one more system out of that in, the, in a new version of the course. But for the most part, you know, if you find an edge that uh, is able to persist, it can persist for a, a very long time. Now, not everything persists forever. So you got to be able to identify that. But, you know, you shouldn't be making a new system every month or every year. So I imagine the temptation would be uh, is to try and find the holy grail of systems to say, oh, what if I you know, add in this indicator and subtract that one and let me backtest it and backtest it over different periods of time. So it sounds like uh, you've hit on a system that is performing well enough and you have not been too tempted to try to tweak it and retweak it and until you, quote, get that best system. Right. Find something that, that works pretty good and that you can live with the ups and downs and then combine that with other systems um, that do completely different things. So, uh, you know, I have a um, I have a few models that I call my uh, swing models that I trade for myself and uh, and for clients. I, I, I'm an investment advisor in addition to doing a quantifiable edges. And so. I have what I call my swing 100, my swing 400, and my ETF swing, and they're similar to each other in concept. And but they'll, the, you know, the the swing 100 and swing 400 both trade S and P 500 stocks, right? So those do that. And then I have another system that trades Phi, and that is based off of, uh, you know, the 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 initial swing systems are based off of concepts I, I did years ago on, you know price stretches and we're looking for rebounds, uh, reversion to the mean type stuff. And then uh, my spy hunter system is based off of uh, VWAP. It's a it's a different indicator. And then I have one called uh, duration rotation that trades treasuries. And I have uh, VIX systems. And so, uh, you know, if you, if you have systems that are uncorrelated to each other, you know, and then I got the, the 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 models from the market time, of course, I mentioned, right? So that that's more of a trend following. So if you have systems that are uncorrelated to each other, that's where you get real value. It's not the it's not the perfect system that's gonna make you a bunch of money, but if you have uh, several systems that all can be making money at different times or coming, then you've got a real edge, and that'll allow you to use leverage as well and still. Uh, maintain a fairly smooth profit curve with uh, lower drawdowns than you would have with any individual system. So right. individual systems might have 25% drawdowns, but you combine them all and you put a little leverage in them and the max drawdown might be 15 to 20%. Yeah, I noticed that you have, uh, uh, looks like 10 different um, systems. Is that accurate? 10 main portfolios. So the the, the numbered systems are on the quantifiable edges site. And those really are just, uh, they're setups I created long ago. And they're very simple that people can, they're not like a complete portfolio system, but they're simple setups. So if the way uh, I've traded them in the past is I will publish any triggers that are happening for the numbered systems uh, on a nightly basis. And then uh, people can go and see what the stats are on uh, that system. Uh, what the stats are for that particular security that's that's been traded. So maybe you know 
Microsoft's done especially well with it over the years and Microsoft's triggering today. Well, you can see that. But I generally suggest, you know, you, you don't want to you don't want to be looking at long triggers when the market bias is short. You don't want to be looking at short triggers when the market bias is long. Those are really just kind of trade idea setups. Those those aren't complete systems with risk management or well, uh, with, with position sizing built in. I see. How often do you get long or short or exit signals from your system and then choose not to take the trade? If it is one of the models that I trade for for myself and for clients, never. Like I'm not, I don't override any of them. Okay. So you don't have a, I mean, there's no problem with second guessing. Um, no. Yeah. No. I see. Uh, uh, what What about curve fitting? Uh, we often hear about curve fitting when doing back testing. Uh, what is this and how can we avoid it? Uh, curve fitting is basically, it, it's it's what I, you know, some people also refer to as over optimizing. You're, 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 you're trying to find the perfect parameters that gave the best profit curve in the past, right? So let's say you design a system that gives a 20% return over the last uh, 10 years, but it's had a 50% drawdown at one point. Um, some of this curve fitting might look at that and say, all right, how to say this system looks great. How do I get rid of the drawdown? And <laughs> right. You want to, because mm -hmm. you're, you're trying to sell the curve to somebody else, or you're trying to convince yourself that, oh, if I just knew how not to let that bad thing happen, you know, then I'd be fine. And it seems reasonable when you're first starting a program, like, all right, how do I get rid of the bad things that happened? Um, but you never know what the next bad thing that's going to happen. So uh, some of this curve fitting will, will say, all right, well, what happened in this instance that may not have happened at other times? Uh, and then they'll make a rule to avoid, avoid taking any trades when this particular thing happens. So maybe, uh, you know, it was right before the flash crash or right before the crash of 87 or right before, you know, COVID or whatever it was. And they they note something that uh, happened in a few bars or, or on a bar, and they say, oh, well, if I just avoid any time the setup has this trigger, I'll, I'll be fine. And those are one-off black swan type events, and black swan events happen uh, a lot more often than you would think, but they happen in different ways every time. So you fit the curve to the past. It doesn't help you anticipate what the next real market event is going to be you know is it going to be you know another covid uh is it going to be a war is it going to be a, a financial crisis is it going to be a computer virus that's taking over you know who knows there's going to be some kind of a liquidity crisis emerge somewhere somehow and you don't know how the next one's going to happen so if you curve fit to the past you know how to you, you might know how to avoid the covid crash but that's not going to teach you how to avoid the next crash. So when backtesting, is there a certain such, is there such a thing as an ideal time period to backtest? Uh, are there significant differences, say, between using five, 10, uh, or 20 year or more periods? Um, and you, you mentioned in your documents that uh, you like to have an, un an ensemble of data. What is this and how do you collect these uh, various different points of data to come up with your your strategy okay so one of the models that i i post on quantifiable edges and I, that i talk about ensembles I, so i'm thinking maybe you're you're uh referring to like the seasonality stuff that i have up there uh-huh yes okay. so uh that was that used an ensemble approach and that's just one way that you can approach testing uh, effectively what it does is it takes multiple systems and then combines them into one system or multiple models and combines them into one model so for instance the seasonality model might look at might have two models one that looks at day of month and another that looks at say day of year or, or, or week of year right so you, you can you can break seasonality down any way you want month of year um, a week of month. So uh, that's basically what the the seasonality models do is they say, all right, I have one model that just looks at day of month. I have a second model that looks at uh, week of year. And I'm going to run those models independently 
and take whatever stats come out of those models and then average those stats together to give me my answer. So the stats would say, today's the third day of the month. The market's been up 60% of the time on the third day of the month. And uh, the average day has made uh, you know 0.1% or whatever. We're also in the third week of the year. So the week of year one might say, all right, yeah, uh, we're typically down in the third week of the year. And uh, it's by this much and this percent of the time. And so you take those stats and you you average them together. And they might say, oh, it's, you know, it's neutral. Whereas if they were both saying, hey, we got an edge here, then then you might have a bullish trigger for an ensemble type model. It's something that they do with like forecasting hurricanes, right? So they'll have multiple models to forecast a hurricane and then they take the average one. And that's where you get the, the, the track that they have, you know, real wide. And then eventually it narrows and narrows as, as the models come together. The event comes closer. Yeah. Um, so for your system, uh, I understand you also look at uh, price action and internals. Yes. So uh, I'll look at really anything that I think can generate an edge. So price action is just looking at um, movement on charts, right? So, you know, it, and you can measure that with uh, indicators like RSI or Bollinger Bands or uh, just saying, hey, we were up three days, down three days, or you know, it's the biggest day up in uh, uh, in the last two weeks, or we're hitting a high or hitting a low, anything like that. I, I kind of throw into the price action bucket, right? You can learn a lot from from price action. That's that's my that's number one um, when you're looking at designing stock trading systems or trading or systems to trade the indices, and then you know I'll look at uh, uh, whatever else I can find. So volume uh, or uh, sentiment measures or seasonality measures uh, or breadth, um, all of these can clue you in. And uh, sometimes they'll be saying different things. You know, we might have real strong seasonality, but lousy price action. So they kind of balance each other out a bit and uh, not a great time to trade. But if you've got breadth and seasonality and volume all telling you at the same time that uh, uh, we're likely to get a move higher, that's where you really want to press the gas and, and jump into a bunch of trades. You, uh, some number of years ago, you put out a publication on Amazon, Quantifiable Edges Guide to Fed Days. And <laughs> given given that the Fed Day is tomorrow, what what are your thoughts on, um, on uh since the Fed days have statistically shown a positive expectancy, um, what are your what is your take on going long now, um, given that the market has been down a number of days? Well, in general, when you uh, you're right, Fed days have been a positive event. So you know, come up with any conspiracy theory you want. There, <laughs> right? the, chair, the chairman want to look good, uh, so the Fed days are are up. Um, more often than not. And so Fed days uh, have been a, a, a generally bullish day. Um, what my research has found is that when you have the market doing poorly heading into a Fed day, it's been an even stronger bullish edge. And when you have the market ramping up and going higher into a Fed day, that's greatly eliminated the bullish edge. It, it hasn't become bearish, but it's been kind of neutral. And I looked at it a number of ways. So it might be, you know, hey, are we up a bunch today going into tomorrow's Fed day? You know, that means we might have some front running. Or are we down a bunch today going into tomorrow's Fed day? That means everybody's afraid of what the Fed's going to say. And so when the Fed day occurs, if you're not thinking conspiracy theory, <laughs> mm -hmm. then it, it could just be, hey, you know, whatever we were afraid of, well, here's reality now, and it's not as bad as we feared. And so now the market can uh, can look past it and can bounce a little bit. That's uh, one of the reasons I think when you get a sell-off heading into a Fed day, you you often get a bounce on the Fed day. Now, there's the, another reason it might happen is, uh, and I don't think we see this as much anymore, but in the past, you know, if if we're in a bad market, the Fed might be trying to calm the markets too. Right. So they'll say something that will allow the market to, to rally uh, sometimes. And that's, you know, if we're in a real difficult environment or they might be trying to cool the economy at some point. And 
and that will will tamp down uh what was the phrase uh, greenspan used um irrational exuberance. irrational exuberance yeah <laughs> <laughs> so they're trying to get rid of irrational exuberance in the market and uh and so uh when the fed when when we're overbought headed into a fed day it might come down some so whether it's you know whether you're looking out over a 10 day period or a 1 day period uh a strong move up into a fed day generally eliminates your edge or or reduces it a strong move down into a fed day uh there's a good chance you're going to get a, a bounce the next day mm-hmm. now a couple other interesting things about fed days I'll share one is that most of that upside edge actually comes before the announcement so if you measure from the close of the day before the Fed day until two o'clock the next day. That's where the edge is. Everything after that two o'clock announcement is pretty much noise uh, when you look at it over the long run. So mm-hmm. if you're looking to get in because we're selling off heading to a Fed day, you don't actually need to hold through the announcement. You can you can get most of the benefit by getting out before the announcement. I see. Um, looking at a little bit longer term, I noticed that since the market low of last October, the market's up around 25%. But at the same time, the T-bill rates have increased from 3.5% to 5.3%. Uh, is the old mantra, don't fight the Fed, now dead? Um, I don't believe so. The, the Fed um, has been raising rates and they've had quantitative tightening going on since March of last year. So we're still kind of around where we were then. I haven't found a huge edge in rates like going up and down. I have found a bigger edge in looking at liquidity from the standpoint of quantitative easing or quantitative tightening. And that can be measured back to uh, 2003 is when they have the data on the Fed website. Looking back over the last 20 years, back to 2003, basically all the gains in the market have come when there's been quantitative easing happening. When there's been quantitative tightening, then we've actually had a slight loss in market value uh, over time. Um, not very big. Uh, we're better off having the Fed on our side. You know, they just, if they're providing liquidity, that finds its way to the market. If you're taking liquidity out of the system, that's going to eventually hurt the market. I have found in my experience that the Fed goes too far with everything also. So mm-hmm. if you think back to two years ago, we had uh, the Fed saying we need to get we need to get inflation up over 2% and we need to hold it there for a little while. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Nine months later, they had it at 9.5%. So, <laughs> right. Right. So they completely overshot to that side. And I think they're, if not already overshooting, going to overshoot in the other direction as well. Well, um, I mean, of overshooting, isn't the market's uh, current action of just kind of going sideways, mostly slightly down? Isn't that a good indication that their quantitative tightening is actually just right? Kind of the Goldilocks temperature and that they're not overdoing it. Yeah. So. It's good so far. They haven't overdone it yet. But my inclination is, like I said, they tend to overdo everything. So are they going to stop before something breaks? I'm not optimistic of that. What's going to get them to lower rates? People think that we're going to have lower rates starting, you know, 2024. Well, if that's true, what's going to make them start lowering rates in 2024? Slowing the economy? If it's slowing a little bit, I don't know. Probably not. I mean, they're insisting they got to have inflation down below 2%. So I don't see that we're going to get it below 2% and have the economy slowing just a little bit. And they'll dial it back a little bit and things will be hunky-dory. I think they'll probably overdo it. Something's going to break and that's going to force them to lower rates and try and get the economy you know, going again. So that's my fear. And that's kind of the experience I've, I've seen over the years with, you know, when they're trying to Get it, get the economy hot. They get it too hot when they try and cool it off. They cool it off too much. Mm-hmm. Well, hopefully this time they learn from all their previous mistakes and they just get <laughs> it just right. <laughs> hopefully, the, the the I I think the problem is not that necessarily the Fed is dumb, but they they got blunt tools. There's only so much they can do, right? And and so 
you know, I don't, I don't blame them for overdoing all the time. Um, but I do, uh, I do think it's an issue and I, I wouldn't be surprised if we, uh, if we saw a, uh, a recession, um, not too far down the road. There's a, uh, now what could pull us out of that? I don't know. AI, right. That that's where all the excitement's at. And maybe we get, uh, uh more excitement there and it becomes the next, uh, you know, internet bubble, uh, and then that'll eventually break. But <laughs> there's going to be events down the road, and and uh, as traders, we got to prepare for them. Yeah, I notice in your weekly newsletter you have what's called an aggregator line, which goes above and uh, above into the positive and down into the negative. What are the components that go into the aggregator line to help you help aid you in determining? whether you're in a kind of a bullish or bearish environment. So that's just uh, the aggregator takes whatever studies I currently have that are active. So when I'm looking to set my market bias, I, uh, I, I start by just looking at what the market did today, right? So if I look at the market as we're talking, the S&P gap down, it, uh, it, went lower for much of the day it's been bouncing now it's uh, about uh, where it opened uh, but still lower on the day so i might look and say all right uh, uh based on where we well yesterday was an up day so you know we we have an unfilled gap down from an up day and it's a day before a fed day but we're closing at the top end of the range i'm just making stuff up um, maybe that's something I find interesting, and maybe I say, "Oh, there's big volume in there. What's happened in the past?" So I'll go in and e- examine that. Now, that might be a new study that uh, I look at, and I, I try and look at um, some new things each day uh, if I notice something in the market that's unusual. But I've got about 1,300 studies that I've saved that uh, I have programmed that will trigger. So uh, if they happen again. And so then what I do is I go back and I, if something triggers that I've studied in the past, my program will pop up and I'll say, oh, you know, this is happening. And last time it happened was uh, 2018 and you wrote about it on this day. And then I'll go back and, and read it and then uh, rerun the study and see, okay, it looked like uh, based on what I said before, it was bullish. Um, does it still appear to be a bullish edge, whatever the pattern is that I, that I looked at? And if so, I'll include that as a study uh, that I want to, you know, maybe it's got a, maybe it says over the next three days, we're up, uh, you know, 1% uh, on average. So I'll, I'll take that information into account and say, all right, so we should be up about 1% over the next three days based on this small look at the market. All right. Now that's one look at the market, whatever that study is. I might have five different looks at the market. One might be, Hey, we're down three days and it's price action or whatever. And when there might be another one that says, Hey, you know, we we the market was down a bunch yesterday or up up a bit yesterday, but breadth was terrible or we were down a bunch, but breadth was um, great. So um, each study might last for four or five days. So uh, I might have five or 10 studies that are active and I might have seven of them that are bullish and three that are bearish or whatever. The aggregator just aggregates my studies. So it says, all right, on average, what's all the evidence saying? and if the evidence is saying looks like we got a bullish probability over the next few days, then that's what the aggregator line says. The aggregator says, all right, looks like we're probably going to be up over the next few days. And it's just taking those studies into account. Mm-hmm. Now, the other thing I look at is, are we overbought or oversold versus where I thought we would be based on the studies for the last few days? So if we're oversold and we've got a bullish outlook, that's that I look as uh, a favorable environment to, to trade in. Favorable outlook, you know, bullish outlook, but we're overbought already. And then, you know, potential rewards not as great there. I see. And overbought and oversold are measured by what, RSI? No, uh, I just, uh, so on that same chart, I have what I call a differential line. So that measures, you know, if the studies had said we're supposed to be up on average 1% a day over the last three days, and over the last three days, we were up a half a percent. Uh, rather than one percent, we're oversold, right? We're we're relatively oversold based on on what the studies are saying. Uh, if it thinks we're supposed, you know, we were supposed to be up and we're down, then we're really oversold. But if it says we're supposed to be up one percent and we're up two percent, now we're overbought. 
Mm-hmm. I see. Uh, one of the systems that you use is called the catapult system, uh, which I think you call it the capitulative breath indicator. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yep. And is that um, what is that? Is that uh, looking at stocks that have had a sell off and you're looking for some kind of mean reversion? Exactly. So uh, all these, uh, I, the capitulative breath index, I call it CBI for short. That's from the, the, I mentioned the catapult system earlier that I, I designed that like 2014 or, or I'm sorry, 2004, 2005. And that looks for stocks that are undergoing extreme selling and uh, have been in a, in a strong trend already. So it's probably the, the end of the sell off. It's like the blow off. I look for that in S and P 100 stocks. So just the biggest of stocks. And the CBI measures the number of triggers that are active at any one time. So when, when we have many stocks that are having what looks like uh, capitulative selling occurring, um, that means there's a real good chance that the market as a whole is undergoing capitulative selling and is about to bounce. So the CBI is something that I look at that really comes into play probably two or three times a year. Where we get, you know, some strong sell off that the CBI spikes and all of a sudden it's, you know, hey, we're probably going to get a bounce here in the next two, three days. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do these CBI readings uh, connect to the VIX levels? And do you ever use VIX in combination? So they don't. CBI is really just looking at individual uh, signals in S&P 100 stocks. The VIX is something I uh, I trade a lot, but it uh, it's completely separate research and, and, and cyber signals. The VIX is something I would suggest people learn more about. There's a lot of misinformation on the VIX and it's, it's, there's really large edges around uh, trading VIX futures, VIX options and um, VIX ETFs and ETNs. And, uh, you know, understanding some of those edges. Uh, it's probably my favorite uh, group of securities to trade. Um, because I, I feel the edges are so large. So to wrap up, uh, what do you struggle with most as a trader? As a trader, well, what I struggle with most is my time. But um, uh, as a trader, I think I've, I've evolved to the point where you know um, buy and sell decisions are generally pretty easy. Uh, I've got a lot of my models built out. Um, you know, there's always more to learn about the market and, uh, I'm always curious to, to find new things, uh, to trade that are uncorrelated with what I'm already doing. So that's, that's where most of my time goes these days related to research. It's not taking my models that I already have and making them better. It's finding other models that use completely different edges that are uncorrelated. Uh, and so, how do we do that is, is, is kind of the, the next big, is always the next big challenge for me these last few years. Um, so for instance, the, you know, a lot of my VIX signals that I, I use in trade are, are based off of, um, you know, the tendency for, uh, VIX ETFs and ETNs. So the, the ones I trade there, uh, there's a negative bias for those over time. The you know VXX and uh, uh, and UVIX will will fade, um, and so there's a real short side bias to them, and I trade them short going in and out a lot of the time. Well, is there a way to use VIX securities to trade with a long bias and uh, or long VIX? I guess so. Uh, really use it for protection against uh, a portfolio. And that's something I've developed over the last two years. The next time there is a, or, you know, it helped me a lot last year, right? We saw several big sell-offs during the year and, well, many VIX spikes up into the mid thirties, high thirties, uh, in February when there was the Russian invasion of Ukraine again in, you know, uh, June again in September last year. And so, uh, having a model that was able to take advantage of VIX spikes was something that uh, that helped me greatly in, in, in my trading because I had some other things that were struggling. So 
Um, just finding complementary systems, complementary models, complementary edges is is my biggest challenge these days. What would you uh, suggest to those traders who are interested in taking the next steps in diving into quant trading? Because uh, you know some may listen to this and say, "Well, it feels like a almost like double work and perhaps higher." you know, barriers to entry, um, how much programming do they need to learn? Or if any, I mean, like what kind of off the shelf, um, software programs are available for new traders to get involved in this, uh, at the end, uh, I imagine you feel it's worth it now. Yeah. If you, if you're going to trade, you have to learn a program because you got to test your ideas. You're, you're, you're going to have ideas and you want to be able to see how those ideas have Works in the past, and it doesn't have to be. You don't need to be some advanced C plus programmer or program in Python or anything like that. There's there's plenty of uh, software out there now where you can. I mean, they'll claim they can. You don't need any programming, but I, I really think for robust stuff, it's worth learning how to program a little bit. Uh, even if it's in Excel, you got to be able to test your ideas. Mm-hmm. So, uh, TradeStation I've used for many years. It's good for trading, uh, for testing out ideas on one security at a time, for testing out portfolios. Um, it's not as strong. Uh, I learned Ami Broker maybe six years ago, and, and that's very powerful. It can be a bit of a steep learning curve, um, and you, you, you may need help in programming some things, and there are programmers available on the Ami Broker, uh, in the Ami Broker forums. Software that I've started using in the last year is called Real Test. I like that a lot. I think it's very simple as far as figuring out how to test things. And they've got some great example uh, programs in there. So I would probably start with Real Test if it was someone. But it, you, whatever it is, you got to learn to test your ideas. Like you, you want to know that whatever edge you believe you have, you really have. Don't take anything at, at face value, even if you know it's it's true. You know, I used to I used to say I never believe anything I read about the market, even if I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, then I guess uh, in that case, it's best for you uh, not to read uh, the news on the financial <laughs> markets, right? Well, then, yeah. I mean, the news keeps you somewhat informed, and uh, but it doesn't really help a whole lot in trading. But I mean, even, you know, studies I've written in the past, I don't believe that they're still true. I always go back and retest them. Mm-hmm. Right. So uh, and if if I have a model that's not doing what it's supposed to do for an extended period of time, you know, then it's time to consider getting out of the, you know, not trading it anymore. Right. But you don't, you won't know that unless you go back and test. I'm actually working with someone now who wrote a a model many years ago, and he asked me to take a look at it. He said, "Well, I'll be surprised if uh, if this and this and this happen." And I said, "Well, I'll be surprised if you're not surprised when we look at some results." <laughs> <laughs> the first thing he did when we came back and looked at, "Well, you were right. I was surprised. I didn't realize that this and this was going on." You know, uh-huh. even if you feel like you know your edge, it, it's good to confirm it. One thing I did when I first started trading is, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't have the ability to test everything but I would write down the reason for each trade and I would track it in. And I, I used the portfolio accounting software I used to sell, but you could do it in Excel. It's very simple. You just, this is, this was my entry. This is my exit. This is what I made or lost on the trade. And this was the reason I took the trade. Right. And the mm-hmm. reason was, you know, the, uh, the, whatever, whatever the setup was called. So like it was a, it was a Jeff Cooper setup. It could be a lizard or a Gilligan's Island or whatever I was talking about. And if I didn't have a reason other than, you know, I thought it was going up or something, I, I would write hunch. And I would go back and look at my results and I could see, hey, these are actually, these setups actually work better. And uh, what I learned after not too long a time is the ones that I wrote hunch down next to, those were the worst. <laughs> well, then that's a good, uh, good point for journaling, right? Yes. But you got to journal in a way that you can actually go back and summarize your results I would say at least in a spreadsheet, right? So add them all up. Um, don't just journaling is not just about writing about your feelings, right? You want to you want to know the results um, and be able to break it down in a, in a quantitative way so that you can um, understand where you're falling short and what you need to do, uh, what systems are working for you, what systems aren't, 
Um, and they may come in and out of favor too. So if you know a system has been great over the last, you know, 15 years, don't throw it out because it's had a rough two months. Right. Well, how, how have the last uh, few years of this choppy market been for you? So it's, uh, they've been interesting, right? So uh, 2021 was easy. Um, that was a great year for me. And then 2022, it was split. So I had uh, some models that really struggled. I had uh, some models that did pretty well. And then the ones that did the best um, were, were the ones I mentioned earlier, the, the, my VIX models that had a long volatility bias, right? So those are what uh, kind of saved me last year. You know, and I, I had the ones that, the one that really struggled for me last year was the one that traded trades treasuries, right? So that's no big surprise. It's it's long only, and it just switches from one duration to another. So it'll go long duration, short duration, and it rotates that way. And every duration got killed last year. So <laughs> so that that hurt. And then this year has been a real strong year so far. Uh, the the long volatility model has flattened out. So I haven't lost money on that. I haven't made much with it. But the other models uh, have done uh, quite well as either, you know, the, like the, uh, my trend model has done well and my uh, my swing trading models have, have also done well. They, 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 uh, uh, and a couple of them did well last year. Um, but overall, uh, you know, the, my curves uh, these days are a lot smoother than they were, say, in 2008. 2009, uh, even 2011 and 12 and 13, because I've got so much more uncorrelated going for me now than I did then. I, I'm, I'm not depending on one model to be, hey, this is the way I'm going to trade now. Uh -huh. I've got many different ways to trade now. Oh, great. Anything that you're uh, kind of working on now that you're excited about? No, I, you know, the, the, the VIX stuff is, is really the, the, the stuff that I'm, I'm most excited about. I, you know, it's not just long vol. I trade, um, the curve. So the VIX, the VIX futures curve when it moves into, I don't want to get too technical here, but sometimes it's upsloping, sometimes it's downsloping and, um, shifts in that curve are tradable beyond just saying, Hey, we're going to get a spike in the VIX or we're going to have the spike, the, the, the VIX go down. When we get the spike, rather than saying, hey, it's going to go down, I can say, hey, five-month VIX future is uh, lower than the four-month VIX future. And I think at some point over the next few months, volatility is going to revert so that or expectations will revert to the point where uh, the future is more uncertain than, than closer in in the present. Right? And that's generally when you look at the VIX futures curve. The farther out you look, the higher the price of the VIX future is. And that's because six months from now, things are more uncertain than they are now. It inverts when something big happens, like Russia invades Ukraine. You see the VIX futures curve invert because there's all of a sudden lots of uncertainty in the market. And people think, well, things will likely calm down six months from now more than they are now. Um, and so that's where you get that kind of unusual action. So I like trading the, the curve the shape of it as much as, uh, as trading, you know, up and down. It, it's not always a directional move that I'm trading these days. Well, Rob, I want to thank you for coming on uh, chat with traders. Sure. Um, the, the, the one thing that I would suggest also for people, if they're reading books, mm -hmm. start with real simple quant books, how markets really work by Larry Connors is a great one. And Brett Steenbarger daily trading coach is another good one. Those are old, but goodies. Great. Thanks for the tips. Uh, Thanks so much for having me. Ian. I really enjoyed getting to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, how can our listeners uh, get in touch with you? Quantifiableedges.com. So um, you can you can email me at support at quantifiableedges.com or just go on the website. You can check out some of the work I've done there. You can also get me at uh, Capital Advisors 360. That's the, the firm I work with as a registered investment advisor. Great. Fantastic. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.